just in general, there's a, a certain pressure that gets relieved off your shoulders that you didn't know that you have once coming to Ghana. Really? Mm-hmm. You come here and everyone is just so relaxed, so patient, and so calm. That's that's the word that everyone is calm. Everything's calm. And in the States, nothing is calm. <laughs> you know, so... How's it in the States? It's hectic. And you never realize how isolated you are and how lonely you are in the States. People don't talk to you. You can go days without interacting with anyone. You'll be surrounded. You'll go to the grocery store. No one looks at you. They'll try not to look at you. You know what I'm saying? That's just American culture. We're so... Everybody's in his own bubble. Yeah, everyone's in their own bubble. Cheating people out of money is never cool. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But if someone has shown you like, oh, I'm just happy to be here they're not going to be willing to pay you because they believe that you being there is enough. Mm-hmm. The dating scene, I've even ventured into it. <sighs> and how is it treating you? Okay, so... I go out. <laughs> I do go out a lot. I do like to be outside. Yeah. I'm going to be real. I lie often. You I, lie. I actually, I don't have it on today, but my parents, they got me a ring for my 15th birthday. And so I put it on, and when I'm at the... I'll tell them that I'm married. You know oh, what they wow. say? Oh, it doesn't matter. Really? <laughs> yeah, so that, that's one thing that's kind of scary dating here. I grew up in the States my whole life, and people did not tell me I was beautiful. Mm. Like, people didn't tell me I was pretty. Like, not even the girls. It's really? not common to, to outwardly just tell someone that you're beautiful. And then in the States, when men do it, it's, since it's not as common, you know when they're doing it, it it's because they want something from you. I experience a lot of grief sometimes about my old life mm. because there's no way for me to go back. Mm, how? <laughs> I, it's kind of bring tears to my eyes too because like, I can't go back to selling houses. Mm. I've shot music videos for Stone Boy and Kitty, you know? And so it's sometimes it's, it's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't regret it at all. Hello guys, welcome back again to another amazing, amazing episode. And this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we have dialogue with Diaspora, who decided to relocate, you know, to the continent of Africa. And, you know, living here in Ghana, Nigeria, you know, we just literally came back from Nigeria and uh, we were back to Ghana doing a couple of episodes. And today we do have here a very young woman who decided to leave Texas, uh, USA, uh, to relocate to Ghana to, you know, focus on her career, making music videos with a top, top artist you know in the industry. Uh, you know, we want to talk about her journey and why even she decided to do what she's doing here. So without further ado, Creatrix, welcome on the show. Hello, thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. Yeah, uh, introduce myself. I'm Creatrix. I'm 22 from Texas and I moved here to Ghana p- not permanently, but for right now, yeah. um, it's coming on two years and a half. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, coming here, I was a real estate agent, and now I'm a music video director, creative director, artist. Wow. And I'm just trying to find my, my path and explore the journey, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Real estate? Yeah, real so estate. So what was your job responsibility? Oh, okay, so uh, my mom, she owned a brokerage and she's a real estate agent okay. so i was working as one of her agents showing properties and houses to clients. yeah to clients that I was see. mostly the scope of what i was doing to be honest i don't find real estate very um interesting but i do love the money and um <laughs> you know it's something that our family has been doing yeah. for a couple of generations so i thought why not why not yeah definitely since i um, I dropped out of college, Mm. so I needed a job. I needed a way to make money. I needed something, so I decided to get my real estate license. I see. Now, that makes me curious. Let's just go back to the beginning of the story. Where did you grow up in in the U.S.? Okay, I grew up in Arlington, Texas. It's right next to Dallas. That's the major city. Um, I'm the oldest of five. Yeah. Um, So that was my upbringing. It was pretty normal, school, Mm -hmm. sports. I was creative. I always wrote. I used to draw all those things. That's how my early life looked. Mm, So you grew up with your parents in Texas? Yeah, my mom and my dad. Your mom? And my dad. And your dad. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So at one point, I mean, you went to what college? I got a sports scholarship for wrestling. Um, It was also academic, too, I believe. Mm. Yeah, so um, that was my plan, was to wrestle throughout college, mm-hmm. then get a kinesiology um, mm-hmm. 
degree and become a coach Mm -hmm. and teach. So that was like my plans before COVID happened. That was what I was planning to do. And I was a very good wrestler. Um, I ended my career third in state in the weight class 185. So they were ready for me to come in. They did everything that they needed for me to come into the school and be successful, but I couldn't do it. (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't do it. Wow. So at what point did Ghana, even Africa, came into the picture for you? Yeah, so 2018, me and my mom visited my aunt, and we loved it. And so for 2020 spring break, my mom wanted us to go on a trip. Um, my parents had already been planning to relocate. They've always wanted to leave the States and relocate trust it. out of the... Yeah, out okay. of America, like anywhere except for America. So they set their eyes on Ghana, and we came to visit during spring break. That okay. was my senior year at high school. And we got stuck. That's when COVID happened. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so we were supposed to come back, but they closed the borders. So we were stuck there for about three months. You were stuck in Ghana for three and months? And three months, yeah, during COVID. Interesting. Um, because they closed down the borders. And as soon as they were open, I hopped on that plane. I was ready to go. I, I didn't fall in love with Ghana yet. I didn't learn to really appreciate everything that mm-hmm. was made available to me. So I first, first ticket I was able to, I hopped on that plane and I went to go graduate. Um, I had my senior graduation and I was there for a couple of months. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of how I became familiar with Ghana and also how I got stuck there. Um, but during COVID, it was still COVID time, and I just dropped out of college, and I didn't have my parents. I was 18, and I'm in America, like, on my own for the most part. I didn't have anyone to really hold my hand um, through that stage of now, like, teenager to young Mm. adulthood Mm. so I came and visited my parents for extended amount of time for a couple of months um, before I decided to permanently relocate here Mm. and through that time I was able to build a better connection with Ghana through my visits so in between 2020 and um, 2022 I was doing month visits two month three month visits interesting Mm -hmm. interesting but why would you quit college though why Ooh, yeah, that's kind of, it's really heavy. You know, wrestling yeah. is a very taxing sport on the body, um, also mentally. And I couldn't, I couldn't see myself in that space. You know, COVID did a lot on people, um, on people's mental health. Right. So I was already taking a hit from that on top of me just now graduating high school. And I didn't like school. I was always good in school. I always had good grades. But the only thing that really kept me in school was wrestling, Mm. even high school. Um, So the fact that I couldn't do wrestling also because it's a contact sport during COVID Mm -hmm. and how taxing it was on my body, um, I just didn't see a reason for me to go to school. If If I can't do my sport, like, it's no interest for me. And so that was one of the reasons. I think it's a whole, it's, it kind of gets deep, and it's a deep conversation about wrestling in general and how dangerous it can be for the mental health and how it's, a, it's not very a healthy environment, at least in the States. But that was the reason why I dropped out, was because I couldn't do my sport anymore, and I had no interest in taking those classes. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you left that behind. You moved to Ghana with your parents. Yeah. And how was it for, I mean, the first time of you visiting and you the second time you move in, knowing that you're going to be here at least for a longer period of mm-hmm. time. Um, what was running through your mind when you made that decision? Okay. So this is like something that I think like expats, definitely like Americans, they don't understand is like visiting and living here are two different realities. They're two different things. So when I was visiting, I got to experience like the sweet life. You know, you go, Day you go December. out to eat. Yeah, day to December, mm-hmm. you get to stay in the in the hotels and things like that. And then, so when I was coming here, I still kind of had that in my mind. Like that would be my everyday life. So like the bougie part. Yeah, of it. like the bougie part. You know, that would be my everyday life. But there was one extended um, trip that I stayed mm-hmm. for. I stayed for about nine months. I it was see. after I dropped out of um, college. I need to come fix my mental health. I need to be around family. And during that time, I, f- I found out what it's like to live in God. <laughs> what did you find out? Um, I did not like it. Interesting. <laughs> I still didn't like it um, because 
I was now getting used to what it's like to live here, mm-hmm. and it's very different from visiting. Mm-hmm. What made it difficult for you? Um, you can't eat out every day mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's live expensive. here. Yeah, it's expensive. And once you live here for a while, your money starts to convert even to Ghana CD. So, like, now I get paid in Ghana CD. I don't get paid in U.S. dollars no more. So the money doesn't go the same way and you just have to learn to be just to live as the locals do you know it's not sustainable to want to go out to eat all the time you have to get accustomed to the local foods when I first got here I hated okra I hated okra. banku but I love it now like I love <laughs> soup like I'm a local girl you know um so I think that was like the the biggest hurdle for me is getting out this perception that I had of how I'd be living here mm-hmm. and then actually the reality and trying to find a balance because I'm still American at the end of the day. Like I have preferences and things like that. So trying to find a balance or find ways to um, make up for the things that I'm missing. Mm. So that nine month period after I dropped out and I came here just to collect myself, um, I got the the true experience of what it's like to live here the mm. power outages all those type of things you know the the long days where you just sit in your room because there's nothing else to do yeah. um and i was living in tafo at the time the eastern region so mm-hmm. i wasn't even in the city i see yeah so that experience that nine months it was very good for my mental health being around my family and just in general there's a, a certain pressure that gets relieved off your shoulders that you didn't know that you have once coming to Ghana. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And, um... But is it your family that did it for you, or it's just the, the it's Ghana itself? Okay, I would like to say it's my family. Mm-hmm. For I would like to give them most of the credit. Um, because you can be put in the best place on earth, but if you're not surrounded by people who will uplift you and pour into you, it's, it's nothing. Mm-hmm. So I would say it's mostly credit to my parents, but I would say also the the chill culture, the relaxed culture is very needed for someone that is going who deals with anxiety and depression. Because you, you come here and everyone is just so relaxed, so patient, and so calm. That's, that's the word that everyone is calm. Everything's calm. And in the States, nothing is calm. <laughs> you know, so. How's it in the States? It's hectic, and you never realize how isolated you are and mm. how lonely you are in the States. Mm. Um, you know, people don't talk to you. You can go days without interacting with anyone. You'll be surrounded. You'll go to the grocery store. No one looks at you. They'll try not to look at you. You know what I'm saying? Why? That's just American culture. We're so... Everybody's in his own bubble. Yeah, everyone's in their own bubble. You know, I go walk outside to take walks here in Ghana. People will say, hi, good afternoon. I could walk for hours in the States without anyone saying anything to me. Mm. And you don't realize, like, how much people really crave attention and just care. And you don't get that in the States. So it's very helpful for my mental health. Interesting. Yeah, even with the people being so welcoming. But at what point did... Does it stop from being welcoming to being nosy? Because I know Ghanaians <laughs> can be very <laughs> overcaring sometimes. Yeah, I think it. it yeah, so it's, it's a thin line. Yeah. I think. But does it bother you? It does sometimes. And uh, yeah. how do you how do you react to that? I I think. The longer you're here, you start to build a community mm-hmm. of people. And so when I was, when I didn't know anyone, I was open to everyone. And so that leaves room for people to be in my business and things like that. But once you find a circle, you keep to yourself and you, and you communicate with those people, you feel more safe and secure. You're not too worried about people being your business. Mm. I have learned, though, that Ghana is so small. Accra is small. Accra is smaller, and so I think that's something that everyone will run into is just people being nosy and wanting to be in your business, and it does get irritating. I'm very low key, I think, with myself, Um, but that's also something that I'm trying to work on because to put yourself out there to be a creative, you have to allow people to be in your business now. Like that's the job of the influencers to have people in your business. So that's kind of where I'm at right now um, in my career is trying to um, decide 
do I want to be perceived? Do I want to be the face of a brand? Mm -hmm. Or do I just want to be the creator? Mm -hmm. That's kind of like where I'm at right now. Definitely given the culture of like people wanting to be nosy and be in your business. I like that. And I've seen your projects. You've worked on several, um, you know, music video. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the transition from the real estate to making of films. How do you even learn the craft? Of, of filming music videos. Let's just talk about that yeah. part and then dive into, you know, some projects you've worked on, the challenges you experienced mm-hmm. as well. It won't make sense, but I'm just going to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I came here to visit and I was doing real estate full time. That was my job. And I signed up for a film festival mm. and they had classes on screenwriting and production. They also had like um, short films where they showed short films that were up for nomination from indie artists. And I've always been into screenwriting and production in that way, but very to myself, just writing out scripts and writing out concepts in my journals. Um, but I came here and um, I met a lady named Nika. Shout out to Nika. Mm. Um, I don't even know how it came about really, but I told her that I was a singer. And she was like, okay, well, do you want to sing at the uh, film festival? And I was like, <laughs> I've never performed a day in my life. Like, I don't, I don't know how that will work or any of that. But I showed her um, poetry as well because I'm a, I'm a spoken um, word artist. Yeah, so I showed her poetry and she liked it. And so I was able to perform at that festival. And I was like, that was so easy. I used to do open mics in the States Mm -hmm. every Thursday. And, you know, you pay to go and perform in front of people. But I just shared my talent. They saw it enough to be part of the film festival. So that was what opened my eyes. I was like, okay, I'll extend my trip. Because she had a... um, fashion show Mm. in December and she was like I really want you to do a a, a spoken word piece I want you to do poetry so I was like okay I'll extend my trip to December I was visiting in September Mm. so I already decided like okay I'm gonna be here till December and so just through that time I was networking more I made friends and this is right around the time when the um, Freedom Skate Park opened Mm. and that space was amazing for new artists and creatives so I was able to network with them and through that I started doing little projects there was a rapper named Uch Bars and I listened to one of his songs. I was like, this is really good. He didn't, he didn't like it. It was so different from his sound. I was like, let me do a music video for you. I had never done a music video before. But I was like, let me try that. Because I had something in my head when I heard it. He was like, okay. So I got my friend together. And I got him. And we shot a music video off my phone. And looking back, like, I'm very proud of it. But compared to what I do now, it's, it's kind of funny. And a mutual of mine in the creative scene, Six, shout out to Six, Mm. man. She saw my work and she saw that I actually tried. You know, it takes a lot to put together a whole music video from your phone. So she saw that I had determination. And so she suggested me to other directors in the industry just to work under them. Mm. And so my first shoot was under um, this director named Mika. And... I went in there as an assistant, and I did everything. Mm. I did the makeup. I helped with the clothes, anything that they needed. Like, I heard someone say, I need water. Like, I'm running to go get water. I just made myself so busy, as busy as possible. And I went home, and then the next day, Six calls me. She's like, he gave you an amazing review. He loved how active you were on set. Come on my set. I'm like, Okay. So I went on her set. I assistant directed under her again. I just did anything, Mm. whatever, (laughs) whatever they needed. And through that and just being attentive on set, I was able to pick up things and be more before they even asked. I already know like, okay, let me go get the model set for this scene. Let me do this. Let me prep the makeup. So that's kind of how I got in. It was just assisting, asking to be on sets and um, working under these people. Mm. And I gained a lot of confidence. Uh, through that and so through that confidence I was able to now be like okay I am an assistant director may I work on these projects with you and they loved me there (laughs) so um, that's kind of how I got into it it was just I would say I made a music video off of my phone and a mutual of mine saw it and saw that this girl is really trying you have potential she has potential 
And so since then, I was just recommended. And I've been working as an assistant director under people. And through that, um, she got a gig. Mm. And the budget was small. I see. And so for her, she didn't want to take it. And I understand, you know, once you get to a certain thing, you don't want to take the budget. So she offered it to me, and I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> I'm, so thank you. I'm so thankful. Um, so I took it, and it was 3 a.m. in Labadi for Sophie. Mm. And that was my first music video I directed. But, yeah, I got into the industry just by being a hand in any way someone needed. And planting that first seed with that music video. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And then from that point, how many other music videos have you filmed so far? Wow. I don't even have count, really. But I've worked um, after that one. I did Joseph, um, Joshua Baraka, um, and that had King Promise in it. Mm. And that was one of the first big ones that I did because it was King Promise and Joshua Baraka. And that music video ended up getting, I believe, three million views. Mm. So I'm very proud of that one. Mm. That was my first big one. But since then, I've worked with Kitty mm -hmm. um, for Brown Skin Girl with Stoneboy. I've oh, done Camito. Wow. Uh, no, Kitty and Stoneboy Liquor. That's mm. what I did. And then Camito and Stoneboy Brown Skin Girl. I've done Shatawala and... Um, Shatawale? Shatawale. Yes, I've done him for Body with mm -hmm. Mr. Miles. That was a feature. Mm -hmm. I've done Darko Vibes with Oxlade. Interesting. Uh-huh. These are people on top of the food chain. Yeah, these are people on top of the food chain. And, like, I kind of lost count. And even as I'm trying to tell you, yeah. I feel so, filled with so much abundance and thankfulness that, like, I can't even really remember the names yeah. of everyone. But I've worked with some big boys. My first cameo in a music video, that was Tinny. Mm. It was long K. I see. Yeah, and so she came from Nigeria to Ghana to come shoot that, and it was a two-day shoot. I had a lot of fun with that, and that was my first cameo, actually, inside the music video. I'm only in there wow. for two seconds, but that was my first little um, piece. I've worked with Fave. Yeah. Um, just recently, I, it hasn't came out yet, but it's a music video between King Promise, mm -hmm. um, King Promise, Chance the Rapper, mm -hmm. and uh, Shally Poppy. Shally. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'm really excited about that one coming out. Um, and that, by far, is the biggest music video I've done so far. Interesting. Just because we have Ghana, Nigeria, and the States. And Mixed together. If I was 14 and someone told me, like, you're going to help assistant direct and creative direct a video for Chance the Rapper, I would not believe you. Because going from real estate to real that, estate and that, how, and like how? even as a fourteen year old girl, like yeah. I never saw this for me. Mm. I I always been creative, but I just thought like I'm, yeah. I was always okay with living a regular life, being a history teacher. I've always wanted to be a teacher, so it's just very mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, where were you? Um, were you the project uh, assistant, or what, what? What were you within these projects? Within, for the newest music video. Yeah. Yeah, so I was assistant director. Okay. okay. And there's been some, some back and forth. I am the creative director. Now, will the director say that? I don't know. Really? Yeah, because it gets what a little... Happened? The, okay. So, <laughs> thank you for asking. Sure. <laughs> um, the industry gets a bit messy. Mm. And oftentimes... Um, creatives don't get fairly compensated and they don't get their full credit because at the end of the day it's a business and so what had happened to this director that i won't name uh he got a job as a creative director on king promises team mm. at least that's what I, that's what that's what has been said and that's what i believe um he got assigned as a creative director on his team and so his job is to do the whole rollout, I guess, for the album and all these things. Um, but I was his assistant director and also the creative director. Mm. So even though he has the title as creative director for the project, Projects, yeah. I am the creative director for the actual mini projects. Because mm. when we go into work, I'm making the treatments. I'm majority of the ideas like i have voice memos of me saying the plot of mm -hmm. this music video mm -hmm. and 
I'm all through the music video. And so for me, I am the creative director. Mm. But when it gets to business and what someone was contracted to do, I so, don't get that title. Really? So, mm -hmm. you know, when this music video ends, there's a, a cast. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to tell me that even though you perform the responsibilities of a creative director, mm -hmm. you might not get that. Yeah. And that's the thing with the industry. It's like the director at the end of the day has to say over the credits, no matter I what. See. It's not, it's nothing that you can argue with. And that's something that even I have to respect because there'll mm -hmm. be a day where I'll have to maybe make a tough call and mm -hmm. someone might feel like they might not get the proper. Interesting. Um, How did that make you feel? It made me feel bad, mm -hmm. but he was one of my biggest mentors. And before I decided to part ways with him, because I've learned about like, the shady stuff in the industry, the last lesson he taught me was that don't allow anyone to tell you your worth mm. and do not look for people for validation. And also, there's really no friends in the industry. Mm, he told you that. He didn't tell me that. He taught me that through his <laughs> actions. <laughs> that there's no friends in the industry, truly. Mm. Um, and that you have to be very careful and contracts are so important. That's one thing that um, I wasn't implementing before mm. and now I'm implementing is the use of contracts mm. and um, putting out exactly what my job is and what I'm expected to be compensated for in the title. Mm. So that was the issue with that music video. It has yet to be released. I've done my, I've, I didn't plead. I, I gave him a warning. I told him I need to be creative director. We'll see when the music video comes out, mm. if that will be the case. But yeah, in the, in the, in the industry in general, um, you see that people will get hired for a job and then outsource to creatives and then take the credit for it because they can. Mm -hmm. So like you're a ghost writer, but for music videos. Basically. <laughs> no, basically. And, <laughs> and so that, that's, that's basically it. But at least with the ghost writer, you get paid properly. <laughs> and that's another thing. It's like transparency is a big thing in the industry. There's a lack of it. Mm. And um, it, yeah, there's just a lack of transparency um, budgets, people lie about budgets. You don't really know. You could be, this is just my experience. You could work on a music video that has a hundred thousand Ghana CD budget. You don't know the budget. Mm. So you will take 2000 CD. Really? I took 5,000 CD <laughs> on, on, on a photo shoot and a music video and a trailer. I took 5,000 CD and I helped with the creative. Um, I, was, I creative directed mm -hmm. the music video. I will say that. And then I wrote the um, shot list for the trailer and I did built the treatment for all three. Really? So I took 5,000 CD on a job that was probably over 100,000 CD. Interesting. Because you, you have to understand, these people are paying with U.S. money. Mm. Yeah, these, these are U.S. budgets. And you're getting paid in CD. So that's why I said it's very important when you're creative to know your worth. I think in the beginning, like you said, you get so much excited for the opportunity that you don't even stop yourself to be like, let me make sure contract is, is all exactly. set. Exactly. And that was kind of like, I really undersold myself um, in the past. And I, and I took it as, I'm learning this experience because I, I haven't went to film school. Mm. And realistically, I'm very blessed to be in this position, to not have to went to any film school, to not be classically yeah. trained. And be on top of the food and chain. And be on... Yeah, in what, two you know, years? so in two years, and really, I've just been doing the film for real for like a year and a half. Mm. So in a year and a half, I've done so much, and I've always been very grateful and very knowledgeable of where my blessings come from. So that's another reason why I didn't chase like monetary gain. I mm. knew that there was money out there. I didn't necessarily fight for it too much because I knew that what I was gaining mm -hmm. would be far more beneficial. Mm. But now I'm at the point where. These people are eating off of me. You know what I'm you saying? You need to protect and your intellectual Yeah, property. and there, and this gets to a point where, like, I'm not going to say mm -hmm. business-wise, my past mentor, he had, he had that on top of me. But creative-wise, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, he's eating my dust. <laughs> and so I learned that my ideas and my thoughts are worth way more than even the business aspect, you know, because that's what you're selling. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. so I, in the beginning, I wasn't taking anything. I was even getting paid 200 CD for really? a day of work. Yeah, I was doing treatments for free, mm-hmm. things that would be paid in U.S. prices, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? What do you wish you, you would have done differently if you, you knew what you knew now, you know now? Yeah, I, I believe here and definitely in Ghana, like, you have to establish how you want to be treated mm-hmm. um, so people can treat you accordingly. So mm-hmm. I think going in, as excited as I was, as happy as I was, I should have toned it back a little bit and established, like, just transparency and a form of, like, b- respect. Because mm-hmm. I see it as respect, you know, um, mm-hmm. Cheating people out of money is never cool, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But if someone has shown you, like, oh, I'm just happy to be here, they're not going to be willing to pay you because they believe that you being there is a... Um, and I will say I've only done music videos here. But I know how m- more structured it could be. And it comes from the chopping of the money and also Ghana Man Time. Mm. You, you'd be surprised on... Like how many shoots the concept gets changed day of because people arrive to set late Mm. because there wasn't proper communication. You know, people don't have have a clue of how much being on time is so important. Um, definitely in the film industry. But yeah, that's why the music video quality looks low is because people don't, aren't true about the budget and so the creatives aren't able to work to their full capability. Also, imagine if you're able to pay creatives what they deserve to be paid, imagine how incentivized how they would feel, they would how, how more um, eager they would be to come up with ideas, mm. fresh new ideas. Mm. But if we're living paycheck to paycheck, our minds aren't even in us. We don't even have the mental space to create the way that we can um, to our max potential because we're having to worry about these other little problems. So I would say that's why the quality looks so. I would also say that, in my opinion, as being a woman director, people don't like to take critique. Mm. And um, there's like a mindset that it's either my way or the highway, even mm-hmm. if you're the boss. So there's been times where I said, I want this on set. Mm-hmm. I want a purple chair. Mm-hmm. I want a purple chair on set. Mm-hmm. We'll come day of shooting. It's a blue, it's a blue chair. <laughs> I'm like, blue is the new purple. <laughs> I'm like, where's the blue, ch- where's the purple chair? They're like, oh, we didn't have purple. We didn't have purple paint. Mm. Why wasn't I called? <laughs> now the whole set looks out of place. It looks tacky. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I send a treatment of the clothes and the outfits that I want the models to wear. Day of comes. They're not, no clothes, not even. It's a sailor theme. They're in space clothes. Like, it doesn't make sense. And it's because of the communication and the transparency, even for the stylist. If the money and the budget was clear we could give that money to the stylist to source nice pieces Mm. but we can't win directors and producers and i don't know too much because i haven't been on the producer side but it's predatory in this industry and you have to be careful on who's the producer and who's the director Mm. yeah I like that. Let's just bring it back to general living mm-hmm. here in Ghana. Yeah, yeah. What would you say you've been able to learn since you embarked on this journey with your parents' family moving to Ghana? Man, I've learned so much. Mm. Um, one of the things I really learned, like I said, is just to be calm and be still. Mm. Um, you see a lot of people here in tough situations. Like, but they still have a sense of calm and peace. And that's something that, like dealing with anxiety growing up and things like that, that's something that I've really learned um, how to take on. So that was one thing, it's just peace and calm. Not everything is a fight. Now, sometimes I do hate how passive um, Ghanaians can be. But coming from... Oh, don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, just being very passive sometimes, you know. Mm. And you're told, like, it's fine, and sometimes it won't be fine. But for me, being a black woman in America and having, like, already that um, stereotype that you're loud and all these things and you're overbearing, 
I'm able to combat that here. Mm. Um, even though that wasn't my reality, I was never been a loud or annoying person, but that energy was put on me. So being here, I'm able to embrace a sense of calm and also um, gratitude. You know, you see people here, like, they're thankful for everything, anything. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things in the States that you take for granted. And here I've learned a lot, like, about mm -hmm. being um, very thankful for what I have. Mm -hmm. What else did I learn? I learned that I don't need an AC to live. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, in the States, you know, AC is always on. But even in my apartment, like, I don't have AC. I don't have a unit. So that's one thing I learned. Like, there's some things that you think are a necessity, and they're not. And I know, like, AC, that seems like such a Western thing to have. But it, it, it translates into a lot of things. There's a lot of things that you think that you need mm -hmm. that you don't need. And so I've learned how to let go of things that aren't a necessity a lot easier than in the States. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, being a young woman, how old are you now? I'm 22. I mean, Ghanaian men. I know my Ghanaian men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, you're very beautiful. Thank you. How, how, they, they say that a lot. How do you uh, react to that? And even the dating scene, have you even ventured into it? And how is it treating you? Okay. So... I go out. <laughs> I do go out a lot. I do like to be outside. Yeah. I'm going to be real. I lie often. You I, lie. I actually, I don't have it on today, but my parents, they got me a ring for my 15th birthday. And so I put it on. And when I'm at the, I'll tell them that I'm married. You know oh, what they wow. say? Oh, it doesn't matter. Really? <laughs> yeah. So that, that's one thing that's kind of scary dating here is how like you'll tell someone that you have a boyfriend you'll tell them that they're married and they don't care so then it's kind of like okay so if you have a girlfriend if you have a wife that means that you don't care wow. and so that's kind of like what i noticed about the dating scene i haven't really been dating too much here um my friends make fun of me because like i come to ghana but then i talk to nigerian men oh. so I, <laughs> I don't um i don't i can't really give too much like perspective on mm -hmm. Ghanaian men but my friends the ones that are in my circle I love them to death and they're all sweethearts mm -hmm. but the ones on the outside it does get very aggressive mm -hmm. sometimes and not physically or anything just overbearing and stuff you try to tell them no and they're like but you're so beautiful and, and all this um but it's sweet though on the other hand because you know I grew up in the states my whole life and people did not tell me I was beautiful. Mm. Like, people didn't tell me I was pretty. Like, not even the girls. It's not really? common to, to outwardly just tell someone that you're beautiful. And then in the States, when men do it, it's, since it's not as common, you know when they're doing it, it, it's because they want something from you. But here, men will give compliments even in passing. So that's another thing that I really, now talking about it, I really appreciate it from Ghana. It's taught me to love myself and to see the beauty in myself because sometimes you want to, it's kind of sad that you have to have people tell you in order for you to see it, but you do, you know? If you're telling yourself you're beautiful all the time, yeah, that's important, but that's you telling yourself. You tell yourself a lot of things, you know what I'm saying? I lie to myself all the time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't have a much... Mm -hmm to say on the dating scene here. I haven't went on any dates with any You need Ghanaian. more experience. Yeah, I need more experience. <laughs> but um, as far as the compliments, yeah. it does get overbearing, but I'd rather have them than not have them at all. Mm -hmm. And I love that I can look so nasty sometimes. Like, I'll just, my hair, not nasty, just bad, but like, I'll wear like, a t-shirt it might have a little stain on it <laughs> and like you, don't care. you know i'm just running to the store or something or i'm walking about and someone will be like oh you're such a goddess you look so beautiful my queen my princess i'm like dude i haven't even brushed my teeth yet <laughs> but you know it, it's good to know that people see the beauty in you even when you might not see it so i, like I do that. appreciate that yeah. i want to ask you how do your colleagues in america react to you moving and living with your parents here and doing what you do how do they react to it i don't know really? because i don't know because they kind of like went out my life like my friends in the states they they're proud of me you know uh, i get occasional messages like once every two months or something like oh i see you did this like i'm proud of you but you know oftentimes i'll send them my music videos and it's met with silence mm. you know even family jealousy <sighs> 
I, I don't know if it's jealousy. I don't even think it might be jealousy. I will say it is jealousy, but it's subconscious and they don't know. Mm. I think it's more of just like, it's an opportunity that mm. they can't wrap their head around because a lot of my friends and things have not left Texas. You their know? whole life. Yeah, their whole life. And um, Arlington, where I'm from, is a small town. A lot of people, they live and die there. They raise their kids there. Mm. And so what I'm doing here is so foreign of a concept. <laughs> And so I think they don't really know how to react. Mm. I think also what's different between here and the States is people in the States don't want to be fans. Like they don't want to, they don't want to seem like fans, Fine, if yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. I, this is so, it's just an example, but like I come to- It's all jealousy. It's jealousy, mm. but I don't get mad because they don't have the opportunities that I have and they can't conceptualize mm. it. So- yeah, it's jealousy. I know that they're proud of me, and I know that when I do blow up and I get my money and I get that <laughs> yacht, they're gonna be they're gonna be hanging me up, and I'm still gonna let them on board of the ship. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because it's not their fault, but mm. um, it does hurt. You know, friends and family not reaching out to you or not acknowledging your successes. Mm -hmm. When, like, in the States, I would sell a house and they'd be like, oh, girl, ooh, girl. But I'm directing a music video when it's silence. Like, to me, people buy houses all the, day, all the time. Like, not everyone directs a music video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my colleagues and my friends back home, they're not really involved in my life. And mm -hmm. that's something that I notice other expats deal with mm -hmm. is like once you leave you don't exist to them anymore mm. um, and that's very sad that was something that like I still struggle with mm -hmm. and I struggled with a lot mm -hmm. was feeling like my life mm -hmm. in the States ceased to exist mm -hmm. and it is that way um, and I also have to have patience with those people mm -hmm. because I've changed so much mm -hmm. since they saw me two mm -hmm. years ago I was a real estate agent. Now I'm doing all these things. Like I, I even have a different level of confidence. The way that I dress, the music I listen to, I'm a different person. And um, they don't know who I am. Yeah, because they felt like you are no longer their friends. Who didn't yeah. know? Yeah, and even if we talk and keep up on like family things, they still don't know who I am on a day to, like, you yeah. know. Interesting. Yeah, and in turn, like I don't know them because so much time has changed. Fast, yeah. Yeah. What do you see yourself in the next five years within this industry and the trajectory that you're on? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, everything has fallen into my lap. So it's hard for me to say. I, I like to go wherever the most high takes me. But if I could, dis, if I could pick, I would like to um, still be doing directing. I don't want to be in Ghana in the next five years, though. Of course, I'll come back because this is my home base. This is where my family lives. But in the next five years, I plan to um, be directing in Europe. I want to be in Europe. I want to explore that side of the world. I also want to work in Nigeria with short films, music videos, those type of things. Um, I plan to like be in the midst of my music career as well. Um, so I hope I'm successful in that. I even had a little side quest as a radio host like two really? weeks ago. Mm. Yeah, I was made the co-host on um, Guide Radio, the Chill Zone. I had to leave that behind though because it didn't it didn't fall in the cards and it was not beneficial for where I'm trying to be. But I really did enjoy that. So I hope to have like a podcast or a YouTube channel up and running at that point. And in mm. five years. I believe I could have 300,000 subscribers. Amen. Yeah, so. You be, you, have you created a channel I yet? Ha I have the channel. <laughs> That's the thing. And um, mm -hmm. as a creative, it's kind of hard to deal with. I have YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I have like 13 YouTube videos ready to be uploaded. But I'm still in the space of trying to decide if I want to be consumed right now. So um, in the next five years, I hope to get over that hurdle that I'm having of like that fear of putting myself, my personality out there. So yeah, I have the channel. It's Creatrix. It has eight subscribers already if y'all want to go eight? follow. Yeah. And I haven't even posted anything. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Guys, <laughs> let's go show. Is there a video on there at least? It's not, but 
I'll have one posted. Yeah, because they need to watch something. By the time this music, uh, by the time this interview has dropped, a, a video will be posted. All right, so I'll, I'm leaving the, the name on the screen. Please go and subscribe to her YouTube channel. Yes. Uh, I, I do have a new YouTube channel. Okay. So I know how it's difficult to build it. I have 300 subscribers now. Mm -hmm. Guys, go check out the behind the scene on that channel as well. Yeah. But yeah, um, if, if you, you have any kind of advice to people who have stereotype about Africa, Ghana, and you seen what you've seen, what would you say to people like that? I'll say that like anything that you see about Ghana coming out the States, if it's not coming from I would say anything that you see about Ghana coming from the States, like just ignore it. Mm. <laughs> I really do believe that you have to come here and experience mm. everything. You know, even Dirty December, like it's enjoyable, it's fun. But it's also very hectic. The checkpoints. You don't see the checkpoints. You don't see these things. Um, but a stereotype I'd like to break. I think that people think that it's less, de it's, um, less developed than what it is. Um, Ghana is still developing. But it's more developed than what I think is pushed in the media. And that's what I would say about mm. the stereotype. Other than that, I, I just believe that you shouldn't believe any type of stereotypes mm -hmm. and to come experience for yourself. Mm -hmm. And each experience that I've had here in Ghana has been different and taught me something. So even when you visit Ghana for the first time, you still haven't seen all of Ghana, you know. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what mm -hmm. I would say about people who are mm -hmm. interested in Ghana and have seen things mm -hmm. on the news. It's just come experience for yourself mm -hmm. or talk to someone that you know lives there and experiences the day-to-day -day life. Yeah. Will you say your decision to leave real estate behind and picking up um, film, music production has been worth it for you? And moving to Ghana has been worth it for you? Yeah, it's been worth it for me, but it's also sad. Like, I, I experience a lot of grief sometimes about my old life mm. because there's no way for me to go back. Mm, how? <laughs> I, it's kind of bring tears to my eyes too because like I can't go back to selling houses mm. I've shot music videos for stone boy and kitty, you know, and so it's sometimes it's it's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. um, But I don't regret it at all mm -hmm. I do grieve my old life sometimes because I've lost a lot of friends I've lost family mm -hmm. because of the distance and like not being able to communicate with them as often as I used to but I don't regret it, and I have to tell myself that often is like, look, look at all the abundance that is placed before you, these opportunities that have fell in your lap. Like, I, I have no clue what my life would look like if I still had stayed in the States other than what I had already been doing. And it was a nice life, like having money and doing those things, but it wasn't fulfilling. And um, recently, I actually, I watched a, a podcast and it was by Leo Skeppi, I love him. Mm. Um, he was saying that when you ignore your creative desires, that's a form of self-hate because you're, you're not expressing yourself. Mm. So I didn't realize the whole time, like some of the issues that I've had, some of the depression was a lack of me not being able to express myself. And so I don't know how I could ever go back into a space um, where I'm not free to express myself. Mm. I remember um, I had red hair, but it was like a ginger red hair, and I had a nose piercing. I was selling houses, and people liked it, but I always knew that I wasn't going to be able to explore myself, and, like, I want more tattoos. I want more piercings, and that's just something that um, isn't really accepted in that field. And so the creative field is just for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a practice That's of self-love. That's a normal uniform for the creative field. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is even toned down. Like, I wanted to come in some shorts and a big belt and stuff. But, yeah, I think um, I don't regret it at all. And mm -hmm. every day I'm thankful for the opportunities that get placed in my lap. Like, it's so random. And it comes out of the blue. And I notice that when I'm open... Mm -hmm to the blessings that's when they come through and in america i was just very closed off because i was stuck in the machine like i 
I, I wasn't middle class. We were working class in the States. That's another misconception is like people in the States who come here come from money. I understand I have money, but that's only because of the currency. It just so happens that America's a superpower and things like that. But um, I came from working class. You know, both my parents worked. And um, I found myself like I was going to be a part of the working class. Mm. Even like if I became like a, a very rich real estate agent, I'm working for someone. And like even in creative, I'm working for someone too, but I'm also getting something out of it. When mm. someone buys a house, like I don't get to live in the house. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can't add that house to my portfolio and people mm-hmm. look at the house all the time and just be blown away. Mm-hmm. So, so this gives you more purpose, you say. It gives me definitely more purpose. And I realized that now I'm really able to tap into who I was as a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I realized that a lot of the things that I'm doing now, I did want to do as a kid. But I was just taught that being a teacher and being a wrestling coach is mm-hmm. far more feasible. Mm-hmm. And you can have a good life by just being a coach. And it, it's sad because... America kind of taught me to sell myself short. Mm. I would create, I would write these scripts. And I just saw it as like a hobby, Mm. you know? And because Hollywood just seems so far away um, as a a little black girl in Texas. Ooh, sorry. (laughs) But yeah, um, America taught me to kind of sell myself short. Mm. And being here... Um, because there's no rules, there's no regulations. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go to school to be a successful it a director. It gives you a fresh start. And um, there's holes in this system here in Ghana, but you can utilize these holes <laughs> to build yourself <laughs> until you up. Until it gets you where, you know. Um, so, yeah, utilize the cracks in the system here mm. in Ghana. You don't have to have... A degree in film to be a director and these type of things you can really just network mm. and find your space and that's something that i didn't have the opportunity in texas so if you have a final message for the people watching what would that message be mm. my final message would be uh it sounds so cliche but like don't give up on your dreams um they're they're there for a reason um, I believe that that's your soul and the most high telling you, like, this is this is meant for you. Like, don't give up on your dreams, even if it's in a small, um, a small way. Try to fulfill them. Like I said, I just recorded a music video in one night off of my phone. And that if I hadn't done that, like, I wouldn't be here. And it was even like even in that moment, like I recorded the video and um It was time for me to edit it, and I was looking at it, I was like, this isn't that good, you know? And I almost didn't even finish editing it, you know? So if you have a dream, like, no matter how big or small, just take little steps and you'll get there. And don't question yourself. Um, The world will try to tell you that it's meaningless or, like, it won't get you nowhere, but those are lies. Like, you can literally do whatever you want. Mm. anything is possible like you just have to do it you have to take actions and steps to it um i don't know if the quote is correct but it was just saying that you won't fail if you keep trying Mm. um you've never heard of a failure success story they didn't reach success because they gave up you know what i'm saying um so that would be my message is like don't give up on your dreams always take even if the step is small take small steps towards them because those are small seeds that can grow you know faith as a mustard seed yeah it can sprout mm, i like that after mm. saying that you need to literally go upload your youtube video yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so that, that that's that's and mm. it's kind of a topic but if you feel called to do something mm. You're only hurting yourself mm. by not Definitely. doing that calling. So, like, me, I like motivational things. I write motivational poetry. Mm. I, I want to, my YouTube channel, I want to uplift people. Like, that is my goal. And you think, like, okay, the people don't need it right now. 
you know, but there is someone that does need that message. And so you're withholding from them, but you're also withholding from yourself because Mm -hmm. you have something inside of you that you need to get out and you're not getting it out. So you're also causing great harm to yourself. So, yeah, I think that's also like some tips that I have is like, if you feel called to do something, do it. Mm. Even if it doesn't seem like it might benefit you, it's probably because it's going to benefit somewhere, someone else or it might be a domino effect. Yeah. I like that. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. How do people find you? Okay, yeah. So my Instagram is creatrix. It's C-R-E-A-T-R-I-X-X underscore. And then my YouTube channel is creatrix as well. And those are really my social medias as of right now that I'm working on. I'm trying to build a poetry page. It's up. Mm-hmm. It has a couple poems on there, and that is Creatrix Core. Mm. Mm-hmm. I like that. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, guys. Where we are currently filming is called Gender Place. Gender Place is a co-working space uh, located in East Legon American House. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're coming from the diaspora, you want somewhere to work, plug and play, good internet, constant electricity. They do also have nice restaurant here selling nice local foods. So, yeah, make sure you check it out on the link in the description. So, thank you so much for watching. I mean, yeah. if you have nothing else to say. Thank you guys for sitting through my interview. <laughs> yeah, it was very nice speaking. All right, so without further ado, let's say bye-bye to the people watching. All right? Mm-hmm. Like, share, and subscribe. And go check out my vlogging channel. Peace. Mm-hmm. Bye.